I didn't tell my oncologist that I was doing it because I felt that it was my body and I believe completely in body autonomy, especially when it doesn't affect other people's livelihood. And so for me, I was able to beat the diagnosis in four and a half months. And this past December of 2023, it's been nine years in remission. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. Today's guest, Savio Clemente. He is an author, a speaker, even a TEDx speaker. There'll be a link below the video where you can see his TEDx talk. He's a board certified health coach and a cancer survivor. His battle with cancer ignited a passion to help others overcome adversity and thrive. Savio, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Michael, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm doing well. <laughs> I had a late night yesterday, but I'm doing okay. Okay. I had a late night too. I was watching a basketball game. It was worth it though. My team won finally. Oh. So, so it was a fun thing. Fun to That's watch. That's wonderful. I had omakase 10 course chef's counter and it was a, it was a pretty late night. <laughs> it was oh great. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, tell me a little bit about yourself. Where did you grow up? Sure. So I grew up in New York in a county called Westchester. It's about 40 miles north of New York City. And if you ever watch the show, The Facts of Life, I'm dating myself here, but it took place in a little town called Peekskill. And that's actually the town that I grew up in. A small, quaint, very safe and comforting town. And then I went to school in New York City um, in Manhattan. And then I lived in Manhattan for many years. And now I'm in a different part of Westchester County. Okay. So you did date yourself. You're younger than me. Okay. We got that figured out. I love Uh, that. Now, you had some challenges in life that I want to talk about because there was something you said related to that that got my attention. And I thought, man, Savio can really relate to my audience. What do you think led up to you getting cancer? Did you have anything to do with it? And what did you do about it? Yeah, it's a really beautiful question, but it's very loaded, obviously. I would say from a physical standpoint, I was doing everything right. So I was seeing a naturopath once a year. He analyzed my blood, gave me the right vitamins to take. I actually saw him for about 10 years, the right diet to have. And I was exercising six days a week, high intensity, strength training, spinning, boxing. Everything on that end was great. I was even a meditator, a longtime meditator. But I will say I was in a business relationship with three other individuals, and it was so stressful and emotionally draining because I put a lot of my heart and soul into the initiative. And I put a lot of my own finances into the initiative. And it just wasn't working. And they were going through their own situation. And I just honestly, Michael, didn't have the courage or the wherewithal to end that relationship. I let it go. So I'm not saying that was the main reason why I had cancer, but it definitely didn't help. It all culminated into a very fast moving experience, which I can delve a little more into if you want. But I would say that was the precipitous of it. There was mental and emotional baggage that I was carrying that I wasn't able to process properly. We like to talk about whether it's cancer or the common cold, the things that you can do about it and the things that will hinder as we talk about things like nutrition, exercise, rest, positive mental well-being, that being one of the main component. And it's funny because when you think about nutrition, I don't think about what you eat. That's diet. Of course. But nutrition is kind of the blood chemistry, the end result of what you eat, the end result of how you exercise, the end result of thoughts. When you think certain ways, it makes chemistry in your body. And negative thoughts create negative chemistry. That's negative nutrition. So it's not at all far-fetched to say that that was a contributory cause to maybe a less than optimal immune system. And let's face it, all that exercise is stress too. It's a different kind of stress and it's good and it might help relieve some of the mental stress, but it's stressful on the body physically as well. So not that you were necessarily doing anything wrong, but I relate And yeah, those thoughts just can't inhabit your brain. How'd you finally end that? Yeah, so it was fast forward. It was so, um, so all I remember is I took a trip with a friend 
to London, Paris, and Amsterdam. And while we were staying at the different locations, I remember having drenching night sweats. And I just chalked it up to the environment, something I ate, time change. I don't know. I just, I just kind of ignored it. I came back to the States and I started having them like really, really drenching night sweats. And then all of a sudden my stomach started getting distended bigger and bigger. And I'm like, uh oh, something is really wrong. So I went back to the naturopath and he analyzed my blood. He's like, Savio, there could be like three or four things here. I really think you need to go and seek mainstream medicine. And I suggest you get a sonogram. I'm like, oh, sonogram? He's like, yeah. I'm like, okay. I ended up getting a sonogram. They wouldn't let me leave the office after I got the sonogram for like an hour and a half. They told me to get a family member to come pick me up. And I'm like, wait, (laughs) I drove myself here. They're like, yeah, you need to go to the hospital. I'm like, what? And so I went to the hospital. And within an hour, they admitted me to the fifth floor. And then that night, I heard the nurses saying that I would be transferred to the seventh floor, which they call the cancer floor. So that's how I found out that I had cancer. I didn't know what kind of cancer. Eventually, I found out it was DLBCL, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. So it was a blood cancer. And it was stage three. It was only until they put a nephrostomy tube in me to let the liters of fluid from my abdomen that the doctor whispered in my ear that it was a stage three and it was non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. My, oh, my. So when you heard that, what was the feeling like? It wasn't a great feeling, obviously. It was, I think my personality is just one where I've had several challenges in my life and I view life through a different lens. I see life as a series of um, tests and challenges that we have to face and confront as harmful, as painful as that could be sometimes. And I just said, listen, because the doctors, they ended up having to do a uh, bone marrow aspiration on me. And they said, Just to let you know, people have kicked, screamed, spat, used expletives at us, so we're okay. And all I I remember is I was sweating profusely, and they did it, and they both of them came to me. They're like, wait, we've done this hundreds of times, unfortunately. You didn't even do anything. I'm like, I, I looked at them, I said, doctors, what do you expect me to do? You're here to help me, right? You're here to help me heal. And me complaining or me resisting the process is not going to make your job easier. And it's certainly not going to make my healing any easier. It's just do what you need to do. And they're like, wow, that's, they're like, we've told a lot of people that they've had cancer and you're the only one who took it this way or like recently took it this way. And I'm like, life throws you curveballs and and shit happens. And the only way to get through something is to literally get through it. Don't ignore it. Don't try to overanalyze it, but just try to deal with the situation one moment at a time. And that's, that's what I chose to do. There's a beautiful mental component for them, too, in making that connection and saying, wow, we have to help this guy. We have to help this one. What a joy he is. So I like that. Thank you. You've interviewed a couple hundred plus people that have survived cancer. First of all, how do we define that? How how do we know when you have survived cancer? Mm, That's a really good point. So For me, it's when you're out of treatment and you've given that remission status. For me, it my story goes after doing, I decided to do an integrative path. So I did six rounds of RCHOP chemo every three weeks. And in between that, I did a whole bunch of integrated modalities. I set a Google alert. I researched up and down on anything I could get my hands on when it came to my type of blood cancer or cancer or lymphoma. And I didn't tell my oncologist that I was doing it because I felt that it was my body and I believe completely in body autonomy, especially when it doesn't affect other people's livelihood. And so for me, I was able to beat the diagnosis in four and a half months. And this past December of 2023, it's been nine years in remission. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's anyone who's out of treatment and trying to get some semblance of their life back. And, and And you were correct. At this point, I've interviewed 200 cancer survivors in different walks of life, different types of cancers, different stages of cancers. And the way that started was just an interview series that I pitched to my editor. I'm a journalist, and he's, he thought of a brilliant title, I Survived Cancer, and here is how I did it. And then on the back end, he said to me, after interviewing at that point, 175 cancer survivors, he's like, this needs to be a book. So I ended up launching a book with 35 of their stories, told my own. And the good news is that the stories of hope survived, and, and that was evident in it becoming a bestseller in several categories. So I was just happy that I was able to garner the interest in people thinking that they can overcome something like this. Because the through line that I kept hearing interview after interview after interview was cancer doesn't have to be a death sentence. 
there is a way through it and there's a way around it and there's a way over it, but it's hard. I'm Dr. Haley, and oddly, the supplement that changed my health the most was not aloe vera. It was powdered fruits and vegetables, but it did not come in capsules. I used to take a brand that came in capsules, and I did not notice a difference. But when I tried a brand where the serving size was a scoop equal to more than 40 capsules, I could feel a difference. That's where Aya Green's powdered vegetables and fruits comes in. And to make it easier for you this month, April of 2024, you can use the coupon code IAGREE, one word, I-A-G-R-E-E, without any spaces, to get 20% off a single can purchase. Normally, you'd have to buy a bundle of three to save 20%, but I'm convinced you will notice the difference, you will notice the benefit, and come back for more. There's a good chance you'll also find a free shipping option, so head to HaleyNutrition.com now and use the promo code IAGREE for 20% off IAGREEN's single can throughout April 2024. Now, back to the show. I know there's going to be some great content in that because as people are reading the stories, they want to know, especially if they're fighting cancer, how did others do it? And I'm unfortunately going to try to get that content on this show, but people will still want the book. Where should they go to get it? Sure. They can go to Amazon, search I Survived Cancer. Here is how I did it. You could also look at my website, SalviaPClemente.com. I have links to every asset <laughs> that I'm creating in the world. To try to really bolster the the intent for myself is to really allow people, for me to be an example of someone who survived something like this and come out the other side and have others find that inspiration or that courage within. Okay. Well, based on all the interviews you've done and your own experience, and you already used one of the words that we're going to need a definition of, because I want to know how many people did a all natural, how many did integrative, how many did only medical and survived according to that got, I got to remission. Yeah. I would say from the 175 interviews at that time that I did, now it's 200. I would say about 65% did regular medical treatment. Only? Uh, Yes, completely only chemo. Most of them, unfortunately, were breast cancer survivors. I put a call out, my editor put a call out for people to talk about other types of cancers, but breast cancer just kept coming over and over again. So the majority are female stories. And then I would say about 20% did an integrative path like I did, and maybe 5 to 6% just did only natural treatment. So they all survived. I mean, there was a couple of really key stories in there that really gravitated, like I gravitated towards. One of the guys had pancreatic cancer. He was told he had a 2 to 4% chance of living. He was a finance guy. And he's like, wait, why can't I be part of the 2 to 4%? Why do I have to be part of the 96%? And then I had another one, an actor named Rob Paulson, and he was a voice actor for Hollywood. He's done Piggy in the Brain, Animaniacs, and he had throat cancer. So it was a double whammy for him because it was not only cancer, but it was his livelihood, what he loved doing. Fortunately, he survived it, and he's still working in Hollywood at the moment. And for those listening, the definition, the integrative, you're combining the medicine with the natural. This is where I want people to kind of learn how they know the right path to take. And this is where I heard you talking, which kind of resonated with me. I'm always trying to help people know what the right path is, whether it's how much of the supplement should I take? How long should I exercise? And sometimes doctors use I'll call them gymnastics, to bring the subconscious into the conscious, whether it's a muscle testing or whatever the case is. I don't think that, and this is my take, I'm going to upset people that love their muscle testing. I don't think you're stronger or weaker. I think your brain is intentionally interfering with the signal to communicate to you the truth. And, and we have all of these little, I'm, I pull my fingers apart or I push down on the arm and and. Well, you're not pushing as hard. You might not realize it. Your brain's not letting you push down on my arm because you believe, and it's probably right. So I, I want people to understand how to know the path they should take. As you went through the statistics and people heard, oh, integrative is this approach and there's that, that. How do you feel about those things? It is... Even if the one with the most success felt the least comfortable to you, at least you now know that that makes you uncomfortable. And there's probably a reason for that. 
And maybe the one that was least successful, you might be saying, but that just seems right for me. Well, then it might be. How do you bring that all knowledge, the thing that has turned peanut butter and jelly into who I am today, how do we tap into that to get the right answers? So I can start off by telling you a story of what happened to me. So I was in the hospital. I was told I just had cancer. I had a call from a friend, someone who I probably consider a very extremely wise person. Uh, I'm no longer in contact with her, but we've known each other for over 15 years. And she said to me, Savio, wait, you're, you need to get chemo right away? Because the, the medical director said that to me, actually. She's like, if you don't get chemo before you leave the hospital, I was in the hospital for 15 days. She's like, I don't know what's going to happen to you. I'm like, wow, it's, it, it's that serious? I'm like, yeah, it's that serious. I'm like, okay. So I, I asked her and she's like, you sure you want to get chemo? It ravages the body, the good and the bad. It's, it's a very risky move. And I thought about it. And I don't know, I think sometimes you need to just rely on silence because silence is really a moment in space and time where you're able to just sit. I think we're so distracted. And I kid you not, a movie from, a movie from the 90s came to me. It's the movie called uh, Siddhartha, but it, it was called Little Buddha, but it was about Siddhartha. And Keanu Reeves starred in the movie. I tell the story all the time because it's very important to me, the story, because it really allowed me to decide. And in the movie, Keanu Reeves plays Siddhartha. He gave up all his worldly desires. He's there meditating with two other ascetics. He's living on literally nothing, maybe like a kernel of rice a day. And he overhears two individuals on a fishing boat. And one of them has an instrument. And the older individual says to the young person, he's like, if you hold the string too tight, it will snap. And if you leave it too slack, it won't play. The path is the middle way. And it was like, I, and I, it was like a flash of insight. I'm like, oh, I can do both. I don't have, I can say yes to the doctor and do what I need to do. And yes, I can do those other things because I believe in my own body autonomy. And I'm like, that's what I'm going to do. And so I chose to do that. So I think the key there is to find some way to get into self. So we can talk a little bit about my TEDx talk, which is called Seven Minutes to Wellness, How to Love Your Inner Stranger. That's where that impetus of my TEDx talk came from. It was from 2014 when I was in the hospital bed, bedridden for a week because of the nephrostomy tube, and thinking to myself, this stranger, this physical body of mine that's dying, and there's just other parts of me, this emotional and mental and vibrancy and relational aspects of myself that I feel that's so uh, still alive. How do I pull myself out of that? And so for me, the answer was that. I mean, you could do it through journaling. You can do it through meditation. You can do it through <laughs> what I call the Aloha reboot. We can go into later in my TEDx talk where you can actually say hello to your inner self. But I think the key there is to just really stop the noise because I think your loved ones mean well and your family members mean well, but no one really knows unless you've been through cancer. No one really understands you. And so I think the first key is to understand yourself. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Know your inner self. Say hello. What's the rest of the aloha? Sure. So A stands for acknowledgement. So acknowledge the present moment. Just acknowledge where you are. Don't pretend it doesn't ex happening. It's happening right now to you. Listen to that inner voice somehow. I call it the three brains, the head, heart, and gut. They speak to you. There's consciousness there. There's anecdotal evidence that proves that there's some wisdom there. It's your job to figure out what that wisdom is. No one can tell you what that is. O stands for opening. And this is huge in all the interviews I did, which is open yourself up to self-compassion and self-forgiveness. So the way I thought of the Aloha reboot was through something called Huna healing, which is a Hawaiian healing modality. And there's an offshoot of that called Ho'oponopono. And really, it's just these affirmations that you say about self-forgiveness, self-reflection, self loving yourself. H stands for harnessing. So harness that wisdom that you garnered and gained. And A is the most important. It's really acting with intention and with purpose every day. And so that's what I call the Aloha Reboot. Very nice. For myself, if I'm trying to hear something and I'm being in silence and I'm not hearing anything, I will press the issue a little bit by testing. In other words, let's say it was high vitamin C therapy. Okay. How much should I have a day? What's going to be the right amount for me? Uh, I'm not really sure. Okay, what about five milligrams a day? Well, that doesn't seem like enough. How about 100,000 a day? That seems like too much. 
okay. And as I test, I'll eventually come to that middle point where it's like, yeah, that's kind of the, that, that, that feels right for me. And then I might look it up and say, okay, is that safe? Is that normal? Is it within the range that's allowed? People ask me, I, I have an aloe vera company and everyone wants to know how much should I drink? A gallon a day. That seems excessive. Just have a teaspoon. That doesn't seem like enough. What were you hoping I would say? Well, I was kind of hoping you would say like eight ounces a day. Well, there you go. You know, you just figured it out on your own there because the answers are in us. This wisdom that two cells came together from our parents and this cell started dividing and turned into who we are. And it's been taking the things we put in our face, turning it into more of who we are. It's been healing us. We, we breathe without thinking about it. We blink our eyes and we sleep and our heart keeps on going. The knowledge is there. Our book smarts aren't so smart. But if we can learn to pay attention to the source of all knowledge, that wisdom that's in each one of us, that's when real success and health and happiness happen. Yeah. And I love the fact that you underscored that because that's the tenet of coaching. People think coaching is therapy. It's not. Coaching is where you are and where you want to go. And coaching is not an advisory role. Coaching is not mentorship. Coaching is not consultancy. Coaching is the coach actually taking you on a journey, cr creating a container for you to figure out the answers because I will never be an expert on you. You will always be an expert on yourself, but I can allow you to shed some layers or see some other perspectives that will allow that answer to land for you in such a deep way. That's where profound change happens. That's where people use the phrase transformation happens because I can tell you something but if it doesn't mean anything to you, you're not going to act on it. You're not going to do anything about it. And that's why I love doing that with my clients because they're like, oh my God, that little germination of information that I, that they found allows them to carry that forward in their own lives and unravel things both professionally and personally. It's just a beautiful experience to witness. It's actually when people say to me, they're like, you do journalism. I'm like, I love the coaching aspect. When I spoke to Venus Williams, she's one of the people I interviewed at the wellness company. She's great. And she did talk about the fact that everyone sees her as this epitome of sports, but she has her own digestive issues and that was hindering her process. When I'm doing those interviews, it's wonderful to get thought leadership and get expertise and insights, but it's a whole different ballgame when you're there in front of someone and you're like actually allowing them to see vast resources that they have ignored or didn't want to see or feel like they're not worthy of. Yeah. As you were saying that, it's funny because sometimes when I'm not sure the answer, I'll ask people for advice. And I can often figure out the right way to go, especially when they give me the wrong advice. Because I didn't know it was the wrong advice until I heard it. But now that I heard it, and as a coach, uh, and, and I experienced the same thing in extracting the right answer out of people, sometimes it's bouncing things off them and you watch their reaction. And then, okay, this isn't right for you. This is. And now we both know. So, yeah. and, Ex and especially since sometimes they'll say something but their body says another. And that's when an expert coach really can observe. They can see, wait, you shrugged your shoulders or you winced a little bit. You sure you really want to do that or you don't? I mean, it's up to you. That's where the magic happens, I find. I love it. Let's contrast that. What are some of the limiting narratives that people have that interfere with progress, with success? I think some people don't give themselves enough credit. And I know that sounds a little silly, but they just don't because they feel like, how can I manage all these things? It's not about managing all these things. So I'm managing one thing at a time. So just break it apart, reverse engineer whatever you can or can't do. I was on a panel a week and a half ago, not my audience, but they invited me on to speak. It was a panel of stage four prostate cancer patients, not survivors. And they tried all avenues. At this point, they've gotten the fact that they're mostly likely not going to make it. And I said to myself, how, do I, how am I going to serve them in this moment really, really well? Because they're not my audience, right? It's not about what I do is, okay, you survived this horrible thing. Now, how do you want to tell your story? How do you want to amplify your impact? How do you want to create a new version of yourself? I can't, I can't say that to them. So there's one guy who talked about, this is happening to him. This is happening to them. And I said to him, okay. 
So the coach and me came out besides the interviewer. And I said, okay, if I waved a magic wand and took away your cancer, it's completely gone today. At this moment, it's completely gone. What would you do? And he's like, oh, okay, I would do this. I would do this. I'm like, okay, so write, write that down. Is there mm. any way you could move that needle a little further and say that you could tackle? He's, he's like, yeah, I could probably do one or two things. I'm like, so then what's stopping you? Because at the end of the day, it's not over until it's over. Healing right. happens in all ways. And I say this all the time and I'll still say it. It doesn't always happen in the medical office. It doesn't always happen in the chemo bed. It doesn't always happen. It happens in moments where we don't know because healing is a mystery. And it's our job to figure out highs and lows of where that answer lies for each of us because each of us, each of our story is different. And the thing with that panel that they really appreciated was the fact that they can still leave a little mark and a legacy. They still have time to do that. Because this guy was so living in the survival that he wasn't living in the living or the thriving. And that really allowed him to see outside of himself. So Yeah. Wow. And we've all heard stories of people that were given 10 days, two weeks, everything, medicine failed them. They tried now, everything failed them. And then all of a sudden they figure out what they need to get well or what they need to do or whatever the case is. So regardless of the situation, I would say never give up, never lose hope. It's one of my favorite movies in the world, The Shawshank Redemption. Get busy living or get busy dying. You only have two choices. That's the ethos that I live in. And so I'm just trying to be an example of a cancer survivor who came through something and just showing that I am living that truth. There's never a guarantee. I'm nine years in remission. I get a scan every year. I was told I don't have to, but I just do it for my own, for my own sanity. And I feel great. And I'm keeping on, keeping on, as they say. So that's what I'm doing. I like the statement from the movie Apollo 13. Failure is not an option. Yes. Yes. hundred <laughs> percent. Well, it's, re it, it's really funny that you mentioned that because so um, uh, as a journalist, I was sent to, for, uh, to cover the Oscars, the red carpet. And so I, I was I was in L.A. like a week and a half ago and I'm there and I'm like viewing like life in that lens. Right. And behind the scenes, it's a whole different lens because you have all these celebrities who are acting and posing because they're under the, the watch eye of their managers and their PR reps and their peers. And it's so interesting to me because I'm like, this is a great experience to have, but I'm like, wow, because I deal with such a divergent amount of people in my life from wellness to lifestyle. It was just a fascinating thing to see life in those moments because you realize it doesn't always have to be a drudgery. Life doesn't always have to be so hard. We can find ways to create lightness and, and, and something that's more fulfilling. Yeah. When someone's lacking confidence, how do you help them get that confidence back? And whether it's fighting cancer or playing the guitar better. Yeah, actually, this was a client. <laughs> this was a, a coaching client topic just recently. I actually have them just do an assessment on themselves. In the world, how do you see yourself? Write down all the ways and means you see. Them. And then I ask them, probably in the next coaching conversation, because I want that to filter in. How do you think other people see you? And then they write that down. And I'm like, okay, is there any correlation between the two? Sometimes there is. And they're like, oh, wow. So the way I present myself is the way other people see me. And sometimes there's a disconnect, obviously, right? And so really the key is how can we bolster that? So if it's your physical appearance, right? You have to do things in the physical material world to look good. You just do. I could have come on to this interview and not shaved and like look like, like, after I came home last night, like 1245 <laughs> in the morning, could have looked like crap. But the fact of the matter is we have to do those certain things. So that's number one. I would say probably the second thing is really to figure out what their strengths are, because confidence comes from strength. So that's a VIA strengths assessment. There's various assessments that you can do. So that's number two. And number three, I think the really most important thing is emotionally, I read back those words that they say that they see themselves as or other people's and see how it hits them or how it affects them in their physical body. So we do a body scan and we sort of filter out how is it that they want people to see because there's two sides of us, right? There's this personal side of us that are fun, engaging. We do all these crazy things on Instagram. And there's the professional side of us that works in the office or works remotely that we put on LinkedIn that, that we only want people to see. And so I really will just really ask them when you, when it comes to confidence, 
It's confidence, something you want to have consistently. It's something you want to have in a professional setting. It's something you want to have in your, prof- and most of the time it's always in a professional setting. But the key is, I think, is to marry the two because you want to be a whole person, not just a person for others. Yeah, yeah, I agree. How do you handle setbacks? I have an answer for this and I will compare them. Uh, I think I'm going to learn from you though. It depends upon, if it's a medical setback, that's a really big blow because a large part of this process and when I talk to clients and I was on that panel, when a doctor gives you that type of news, you feel powerless. I mean, I call it not Dr. Oz, the celebrity doctor, but the Oz effect. You're like, wait, they are this, this great and powerful Oz that's giving me this information and you feel powerless. But doctors only can give you that physical aspect of self. There's this other side of self. There's this emotional self. There's this mental self. There's your dreams that you're having. There's relational issues. There's your spirituality. There's your feelings of your connection to something higher than yourself, a God or or universe. And so I often say to them that you really need to figure out for yourself, what is the motivating factors in all that? Is one thing taking more precedent than the other? Are they all equally alive within you? And figure out for yourself, how can you make some of those aspects of self better or more in tune with what you want? That's my quick answer. (laughs) I would love to hear yours, though. Well, mine comes from Charles Stanley. God rest his soul. Passed away last year. But I watched a sermon and it was all about, well, not only receiving compliments, but also uh, rejections and, and insults and, and people telling you this about you and that, things you don't want to hear. And I've taken that and I've applied it to other areas of my life. When things fail, I always ask, what can I learn from this? And then the next question is, what can I do about it? What can I do better? What can I do about what I've learned from it? How can I prevent this or make sure it doesn't happen again? Can I do that? And for me, it's a very not so emotional, but logical, okay, what is there to learn? Something went wrong in business. What can I learn? I have an angry customer. What can I learn? How can I make sure that doesn't happen again? When it comes to health, yeah, what can I learn about it? Where where did I go wrong? i not doing the nutrition right. Exercise is the rest. Is it the mental well-being? Which one of those stands out? Exercise, okay, let's dig deep into the exercise. Am I doing flexibility training, strength training, endurance training? And I start breaking it down, looking, which one do I feel like I'm the weakest and that I need to make the correction in? Or nutritionally, where do I need to make the correction? What's wrong with my sleep? Why aren't I sleeping? What's interfering with my sleep? Is it my stinking thinking? Is it the things I ate? So I always want to say, what can I learn? What can I do better? Yeah. And, and and to add to that, which is beautiful, it's to me also this idea that it's like a quote I heard about this fact that people often use the phrase karma, like I deserved it or it's karma. No, karma happens and whatever your belief system is about that is whatever it is. It's about how do you respond to it? Because you can undo things that you've created. It is possible to do that. And so I think that's where self-responsibility comes into play. But I, I agree with you. You have to be really truthful with yourself and figure out in different aspects of life, where, where can you fix that? Yeah. Karma, laws of nature. We, we have to admit that there's something that exists in there. We have some say in the things that happen to us, Yeah, whether good or bad. 100%. But we also have the power to rewrite, which is wonderful about the life experience. Because ah, yes. just because I, I was in a room that day in 2014, July, with four other roommates, constantly rotating. Two of them had brain cancer. And one of them wanted to leave the hospital. He was yelling and screaming at the doctors and the nurses. And I said to him, I was like, I know it's none of my business. I barely know you. But I'm like, what are you rushing home to? Because they're here to try to help you, right? And he's like, I'm going home for my dog. And I was talking to that friend of mine who, who mentioned the chemo aspect. And she goes, Savio, you don't get it. I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, he's scared of dying. He's not you. He's not like thinking about his next steps. He's thinking that he's not going to make it. And I'm like, oh my God, that was like one of my greatest lessons. I'm like, that's when I learned true humility and through empathy. Cause Mm. I'm like, oh, that's what he was wrestling with. He's not there. He doesn't have that next step, that vision that I'm having 
to see where my life can take me. He's thinking my life is over. Right. Uh, and that's why he wanted to just go home. And mm. they ended up releasing him because that's what he wanted. And for those that don't have hope, I think of one of our customers who tells the story of his father who was given 10 days to live with two tumors in his brain. After chemotherapy and all medicine and radiation had failed, and he changed some things in his life and got well in a short period of time. Six months later, new scans, new brain scans, and little remnants of the tumors, which were probably a scar tissue, so to speak. Wow. But look, at the end of the day, we're talking about things like I mentioned, medical things, very physical, but it's always an inside job. This, you're, people will tell you, people who've had even radical remissions will say that they went in to go without. You have to go in first. That's the way it works. The doctors do, do their part. You can rely on whatever modality you want, but the rest of it is your responsibility. Do you have a newsletter that people can sign up for? I do. So if they go to my website again, sabiopclaventi.com, a pop-up will come up or you'll see a newsletter link. And I write once a week on topics that are meaningful to me. And I'm very honest. Like I wrote my post when I covered the Oscars was about belonging in the sea of Hollywood's elite. And I wrote about my own feelings about that, about where does belonging come from? Do I belong in this space? Even though I was invited, it was a schism for me. But yeah, so they can, they can sign up for that. I send it out every Wednesday. Okay. What's your other website? There's the Savio P. Clemente and the Human Resolve. What's that? Yeah. So my Human Resolve was the initial website I had. It, it's it's my coaching website. It talks about coaching. I'm currently building an online community as well, because sometimes some people just don't have the investment for one-on-one -on -one coaching, which I love doing. And I love helping people see that transformation, but I want to help more people do that. So, but both websites mirror one another in, in terms of where you can find information. Uh, and then it's socially, they can find me at the Human Resolve. It's where I'm at in every single platform, including TikTok, which might get banned. <laughs> we'll see what happens. See what happens. Right. Not just for you, not because of anything you said, but for the whole <laughs> yeah. country. <laughs> yes, yeah, for the whole for the whole country. Actually, I was in India in December. I do a lot of work with National Geographic. And so I was flown to India for 15 days, eight cities. And I couldn't get on TikTok. It's completely banned in India. So I'm like Interesting. 30 days, 30 days. I was without any TikTok, but it was interesting. Now, is there one particular social media that you actually monitor? Because you can't monitor all of them. Yeah. So I, I mostly post on Instagram. So it's at The Human Resolve. Okay. TikTok, I'll just post, I'll like repurpose uh, some of the podcast interviews that I've done or mm -hmm. uh, some of the video content. But that's the main one that gets the most engagement. And it's really a fun platform, I find. Okay, excellent. So I'll have links for everyone below this podcast in the, well, on the bottom of the blog page, underneath the YouTube video, wherever you get it, even in the Apple iTunes description, but those aren't clickable. All the other locations are. <laughs> Savio, I want to thank you so much. Is there any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Yeah, I just really like today's conversation and, and your such rich questioning, because oftentimes when you have a conversation about this, it gets very heady or people want like the science only. But we can spout out 10 research studies and 10 different technical medical jargons, but it doesn't impact you unless it resonates with you. Simple language. Like they told me when I did my TEDx talk, Savio, you're a writer, but we need you to say something in one word, not five words. I know you want to beautifully express it in adjectives. You don't have to do that. And so for me, it's just, if I was to give any type of science or any type of um, um, learnings here besides just the truth of life. It would just be about this idea of self-regulation. It's doing that self-monitoring or that vision or goal setting, because that's really what coaching is, setting a vision, not a goal, but a vision of how do you want to be, how do you want to feel? And also going back to my trainings in positive psychology, which is self-efficacy and managing the situation despite the challenges. No matter what you're going through, no matter what it is, medical, emotional, mental, or any other of the above, at the end of the day, I think the key here is to just figure out for yourself, where can your life go? And how do you find that you can shore up that, whether that's support system, whether that's help or coach or therapist, or what I would like to sort of lead people with doing is really relying more on self and the, the knowledge and wisdom within. So that's the last thing I'll leave. 
Perfect. I have nothing to add. That's awesome.